Many of us that are practicing health optimization medicine or health optimization practice are doing it virtually. So you can do it from anywhere in the world. And what I love about it is that it's a comprehensive framework that really truly creates a foundation of health in your patients and clients. And what also is really important is it doesn't take the place of anything else. It doesn't take the place of conventional medicine. It doesn't take the place of even functional medicine. I have lots of functional medicine colleagues. You know, what we do is we focus on setting the disease and the conditions aside for now. We know that those exist and we try to address them as best we can, but really the primary thing is focusing on the health of the basic cell. And that's looking at the metabolome, as Dr. Ted said, it's looking at all the other pillars of health optimization medicine and creating a full health optimization plan for people. Now, it doesn't happen overnight. People take time to get better, to improve. Oftentimes the improvements can be subtle at first, but this is a long-term sustainable plan. for Welcome everybody. Hi, Boomer. How are you? Hi is a funny word. <laughs> <laughs> let's let's talk about what high means in the context of uh, maybe our symposium. In uh, health optimization medicine, high is a four-letter word always. So we're just getting off the back, so to speak, of the health, first health optimization medicine and practice symposium. We had this in Hollywood, Florida, and it was a day plus or minus. Actually, there are a few days of just ancillary events outside of the symposium itself. But we we got together along with our students and faculty from around the world, around the world, yeah, and talked. Really, I, I want to set what makes us different from your typical health conference, right? So you go to a typical health conference and there's mm -hmm. nothing wrong with those, but you have a lot of keynote speakers, a lot of big names, but this uh, conference was different or the symposium was different in the sense that we were focusing really on the clinician and what the person can do with the patient or client in front of them. And you know, the person who kicked things off is the man to my right, maybe, I, I don't know how this is going to appear on YouTube. So maybe you're right as well, but, uh, the, man, the myth, the legend, the pioneer of home hope, uh, Dr. Ted. And so Dr. Ted, do you mind just uh, explaining a little bit about home hope before we get started a little bit on the symposium? Yeah. Home hope is a uh, really a very simple process. It's the detection and correction of imbalances, especially at the level of metabolism. Uh, we have the science and technology now to peer inside the cell and cells make up all of our organs. So now that we have that science and technology, why not use the science and technology to detect what's going on inside the cell and correct the imbalances before they progress on to anything else. Um, and uh, it, in my lecture, I, it, it's actually my standard, what's called 3373 lecture. There are three perspectives that I teach uh, uh, students, you know, that to shift to, and then there are, um, uh, th three um, uh, principles where you need to also shift like uh, you know uh, I introduce uh, concepts like uh, salutogenesis uh, metabolic neutinization and holobiontology and then there are the seven pillars of health optimization medicine which is uh, really the, the clinical heart of that and then the uh, three things of uh, what health optimization medicine is. And essentially, if you take a look at it, we are really the first and only multi-omics clinical specialty that defines and delivers a standard of care in health, not disease. We all know that there are standards of care in disease, but there is no standard of care in health. And health optimization medicine and practice actually delivers, uh, defines and delivers that for all of us. All right, so Dr. Scotty Chuhati, uh, I want to just put, for somebody That's who's the first time on a podcast, I like. first time uh, we can call you Dr. Scotty doesn't know, uh, but in terms it's of a sad song. the, <laughs> in terms of for somebody who's tuning in for the first time, uh, health optimization medicine and practice from a clinician's perspective, or let's say somebody's coming into your virtual office mm -hmm. zoom for the first time, what can they expect when working with you? Yeah. So many of us that are practicing health optimization medicine or health optimization practice are doing it virtually. So you can do it from anywhere in the world. And what I love about it is that it's a comprehensive framework that really truly creates a foundation of health in your patients and clients. And what also is really important is it doesn't 
take the place of anything else. It doesn't take the place of conventional medicine. It doesn't take the place of even functional medicine. I have lots of functional medicine colleagues. You know, what we do is we focus on setting the disease and the conditions aside for now. We know that those exist and we try to address them as best we can. But really the primary thing is focusing on the health of the basic cell. And that's looking at the metabolome, as Dr. Ted said. It's looking at all the other pillars of health optimization medicine and creating a full health optimization plan for people. Now, it doesn't happen overnight. People take time to get better, to improve. Oftentimes, the improvements can be subtle at first, but this is a long-term sustainable plan for patients and clients that truly can help their health over the long term. And so one of the things that I think is really interesting from a, I guess, patient or client's perspective is if you're sitting out there and you're kind of you know you're reasonably healthy and we haven't really defined what health means but you're not sick so to speak but you don't feel a hundred percent or you don't feel 120 percent and you're wondering like is that whole thing with bradley cooper and limitless is that even achievable uh, this gives you a framework or somebody that you can go to to really test that so if i'm healthy but i want to be optimized who can i go to and so your home hope clinician will be able to help you there. Second thing that I love about this is that uh, when it comes to tracking your health over long time spans, uh, it, it does help to have some sort of benchmarks and metabolomics and these tests that you run with people definitely serve as those benchmarks. You love benchmarks. I love benchmarking. He's a finance guy, guys. And so he loves benchmarks and Excel spreadsheets. Yeah, just one thing I would add that I do agree that Health optimization medicine is great for that population, but it's not exclusive to that population. I have people in my practice with that are elite athletes. I have people in my practice that have stage four cancer because in the end, what you're trying to do is optimize at that cellular level. And no matter who you are, you need that. And the problem we have in conventional medicine is that we're just treating symptoms and diseases without looking at what's under the hood and metabolomics is the way. I mean, it's been called the 21st century stethoscope for a reason. All right, so let's bring us back to the symposium. And so a number of us came in from various parts of the world. I came in from Amsterdam. You guys came in from Boulder, Colorado, Washington, D.C. But we had students coming in from whereabouts? We had people coming from Australia. From Costa Rica. The Philippines, Netherlands. Canada. The United Kingdom. Yeah, those are the places. Maybe more. And, of course, the United States. Well, it, people came in uh, over the course of the week whether it was monday or thursday for our drinks event but let's talk a little bit about friday and ted you already mentioned your lecture your opening soiree and explained what high means in the terms of home hope yeah but we again delivering a, a program that was more towards or focused on the clinician and what the clinician can do if a client is in front of you and so we had people like dom d'agostino kiran krishnan come in uh, but Scott, you had the pleasure of following Ted, and I did my best to compare you to Taylor Swift. Always a tough act to follow, yeah. both Dr. Ted and especially Taylor Swift. But I have to, I have to tell you, I, I did my best to t compare you to Taylor Swift. And so you talked about GABA, which I think rest, relaxation uh, is something that's picking up in terms of trends, maybe yeah. not to the level of the Eras Tour, <laughs> but it's... Nothing something that, that yeah, it's very hard to beat <laughs> yeah. a 4.3 billion dollar economic impact but it's something that i think needs more focus and let's talk a little bit about gaba what you told the audience there mm -hmm. so yeah gaba is a neurotransmitter it's a inhibitory neurotransmitter which means it stops neurons from firing and and what's GABA got to do with it, as uh, we like to say over here, GABA's got everything to do with it. Because if you don't have GABA, you are not going to be a happy camper. And there's something called GABA deficiency syndrome, which is associated with any number of things, anxiety, depression, insomnia, tremors, frequent urination, uh, so many different things, schizophrenia, OCD. And so if you're not looking at as it's something on your radar, you're going to miss it, especially because as we do at health optimization medicine, we're looking under the hood here at metabolomics. And if you can't convert your excitatory neurotransmitter glutamate to GABA, you're going to be in trouble and you need vitamin B6 and magnesium to do that. And I think there's a ridiculous amount of people here in the U S that are magnesium deficient. So if you don't have enough magnesium, you're not going to be able to convert your glutamate, which is your most excited to our neurotransmitter to GABA, which is your inhibitory neurotransmitter. So I had a long lecture, actually not that long, about 30 minutes, just going into the details here, talking about GABA deficiency, talking about how GABA is made, the various types of receptors, 
that are on the GABA receptor itself. You have where GABA binds, and you have these places called uh, allosteric modulator sites, which can either be positive or negative. We talked about a number of different supplements and herbals and fungals and mushrooms and things like that can modulate too. And uh, I'm going to pass it over. Oh, do you want to uh, Yes, I wanted want to add something okay. that's really um, uh, very interesting about GABA is that you know, um, essentially glutamate and GABA are balancing each other, but it's one of those where the balancing agent actually comes from the excitatory agent. So uh, uh, GABA is synthesized from glutamate, the excitatory neurotransmitter is kind of like dopamine, uh, right? Uh, epinephrine is synthesized from dopamine. So this is a very delicate act that the body has to do. And therefore the job of the uh, health optimization medicine uh, doctor or the health optimization practitioner is actually to check that these things are in balance because uh, it's a delicate dance when the opposing uh, uh, agent actually comes from the same pathway that produces the excitatory agent. Okay, cannabis. Um, Jody Duval, who is one of our colleagues, faculty members in Home Hope uh, from Perth, Australia, flew all the way over. Uh, and delivered a lecture on cannabinoids and specifically looked at a number of different of the minor cannabinoids, their roles in various forms of health optimization, as well as ways you can actually test uh, for perhaps whether or not, I think both of you actually have this gene, which is- THC the, yeah, induced yeah. schizophrenia, yes. Oh, so I take it you love THC. I love being a schizophrenic. No, I don't, <laughs> that's, that's a serious diagnosis. No, but we, okay. Uh, so when it comes to uh, cannabinoids, we actually have a module within the Home Hope framework about cannabinoids and how you may test them, but also how you may use them in a clinical practice. And I think a common misunderstanding, it's especially from, I guess, the majority of the United States, when you think of cannabis, it's not always the high we referred to earlier, right? There are many uses of cannabis. And so maybe one of you uh, can take the, the lead here in terms of how we might use some of these minor minor cannabinoids in clinical practice? Um, really, uh, there are uh, two main receptors that are known in the body, the CB1, which is known to be in the central nervous system, and the CB2 receptors, which are used, uh, all around the body, but usually in the found in the immune system. And you'd find that uh, essentially things like CBD, for example, are a exemplary um, anti-inflammatory agents, right? In fact, a majority of its action, uh, for example, in, in improving brain function is the fact that it's an anti-inflammatory. Uh, and, um, and then for uh, the home hope perspective on this is that we have an, what's called an endogenous endocannabinoid tone, meaning we need actually these endogenous cannabinoids, meaning we produce these cannabinoids ourselves in our body. Uh, in order to maintain a certain homeostasis, dynamic homeostasis, especially for pain balance, right? Uh, for example, we know that um, uh, imbalance of uh, the endocannabinoid tone can produce a, the triad of symptoms that has been, um, uh, you know, essayed upon and written by Dr. Ethan Russo, right? Uh, IBD, migraine, and um, was that the one? You're giving the camera the finger, by the way. That oh, was fantastic. Sorry. <laughs> uh, so I, I want to touch just briefly before. Uh, oh, and uh, uh, was this uh, chronic fatigue syndrome? Chronic yeah. fatigue. There we go. Okay. So the cannabis or cannabinoid lecture was fantastic. We also got into some of the minor cannabinoids, not just CBD. So there are other things out there. CBN, CBT was one that I hadn't heard for. Yeah, when, I, yeah, when, I, when I think of CBT, I think of cognitive behavioral <laughs> therapy, right? Uh, so CBN is something that we're all familiar with, CBG, of course, as well. Um, but there was an interesting... Uh, lecture after Jody's and I have to thank uh, the man to my left or right I can't I'm apparently it's okay, stage right, stage left. It's okay. Right. yeah exactly uh, to, for introducing me to him but he was talking at least at dinner uh, the night before about the ability to test uh, the endocannabinoid tone through the gut and how we're developing this but let's talk a little bit about Kiran's lecture and um, just what we got into in terms of resilience, the gut. And I think the guy probably spends way too much time speaking because he's very comfortable on stage. He's the man on stage. Yeah. Um, 
Uh, Kiran is a dear friend, and he's just an all-round fantastic guy and a great researcher, really. Um, but what you talked about is that the microbiota actually impacts basically all aspects of our lives and our behavior for such a you know 2.2 kilo organ right there that we have. It impacts uh, so many things from you know the brain gut connection, connection, the brain liver connection, the brain immune system connection, uh, and all of that. And uh, the thing that was uh, one of the things that was more interesting that you know he uh, discussed was you know the the uh, looking at the skin microbiota and correlating it with the health of people right and making predictions about what the health of people are going to be um, in fact uh, a way back that reminded uh, me of uh, Marvin Edia. So when he was talking about microbiota he said um, he said that you know maybe we're just tenants you know where we're you know you can take a look at our bodies as just the food for microbiota and the microbiota really is the the lord and king of here and we just think that we're lording it over but it's it's kind of a strange perspective but if you take a look at the perspective it's kind of true and kieran drove home that point of the importance of microbiota not only the gut but in the other parts of the body that actually uh contributes to the health of the individual Okay, so one of the two takeaways I got from Kiran's lecture, one was uh, this idea of, and you see this quite commonly marketed in the supplement world, the idea of oral acromantia. And he mentioned that taking it in a capsule form just wouldn't actually increase uh, acromantia presence in the gut. And then the second thing, which I found interesting, and I'm going to try and figure out how to do this myself, is did, did you know Kiran likes to go on long bike rides? He was a cyclist, right? Mm -hmm. and, and he, in the middle of his cycle, will stop and go wander in the woods, take off his shoes and get comfortable. So I think Scott in freezing cold Colorado, I have an objective for you this winter. Take off your shoes, get comfortable in the mountains. You think you can do it? Yeah, sure. Absolutely. I mean, I have cold hypo, uh, cold thermogenesis at my doorstep any moment, actually starting this week, I think so. I can uh, do it. That's perfect. That's perfect. Um, so if that weren't enough and I think one of the comments that I loved was on Thursday night, Danny Williamson, who we all know here, right? And Practitioner Dan in Tennessee, yeah. Yeah, and she uh, came up to me and said, I, and it's Danny, so I'm trying to, I'm not going to even try to impersonate the accent, right? But like, she came up and said, I think you guys are crazy, right? And I'm like, Danny, that's nice to see you too. And <laughs> last time I saw Danny was at her clinic in April. And uh, Danny said, I think you guys are crazy. You're jamming way too much content into way too little time. And we've already gone through one, two, three, four of the lectures, but we actually had a fifth one. And so, uh, Dr. Scott, since you, you brought him into our world, let's, uh, let's talk a little bit about, well, actually both of you did, what the hell am I saying? Um, let's talk about the last one. Yeah. So we had Dominic Diagostino come, uh, we've known Dom for many, many years. I met him back in 2014 when he wrote one of his first papers on the ketogenic diet, hyperbaric oxygen therapy and cancer. And he's been on every single podcast, uh, that you can imagine bar just a few out there. He's a phenomenal speaker. He's a phenomenal uh, person in general. And you know, he and I had some really great conversations about all the various things that he's doing at his lab. He has a great lab at University of Florida with, with postdoc, postdocs and research and has a hyperbaric chamber there as well. Um, I'm going to have Ted talk about his lecture because I was outside at the time manning our transcriptions and home hope booth. Yeah, um, Adam's a great guy. I, you know, like Kieran, I invited him uh, to to speak in the Philippines, actually. Um, and uh, at the time, he was already deep into deep that really deep because he was uh, underwater, uh, living in a in a. Uh, pressurized system underneath the sea, and this, that's why his his uh, relationship with Scott is with hyperbaric oxygen therapy. Um, and he was doing uh, a lot with uh, astronauts and uh, deep sea divers and uh, other people who could actually benefit from um, ketones as fuel, right? And in his lecture, uh, he detailed all the actions of, of the ketones as well as the newer studies, exciting studies that are actually doing with ketones, not only for all of these, uh, you know, high performers uh, and elite athletes, but also he presented all the different kinds of things that you could 
take, you know, exogenous ketones, especially for which there's a lot of interest, right? Even if some of them taste like jet fuel. And I always question people when they say it tastes just, just, just like jet fuel when they haven't actually tasted jet fuel. Well, actually, you haven't tasted I, jet fuel? I have. But uh, other people haven't, I think. Is it MTBs would be the <laughs> metabolite for that one? Uh, so let, let's keep going on this, right? And um, on the symposium, look, we, we had a fantastic day of clinical information, four CMEs given out to everybody who attended. And that really wasn't all of it. Right. Uh, that really wasn't the, the day. The day itself wasn't the entire event. Let's talk a little bit about some of those highlights and maybe we can emphasize the high part. We don't have to. Though. Um, actually, uh, there was a part after those five lectures. The Q&A was actually fantastic. The audience was engaged. We're asked all of these difficult questions. And, I heard you uh, had a sexy moderator. I, I, well, I did. Actually, <laughs> yeah, it was a great Q&A and we got some really great questions from the audience and then started the microbiome labs part of the conference. And we were collaborating with microbiome labs throughout the whole event. They were a great team to work with. And we had a lot of fun coordinating various events before and after the whole conference. We had a booth there as well. So we could talk to a lot of people that attended from the conferences at the booth, talking about home hope, talking about our transcriptions company and we had a lot of excitement from so many people all around okay uh, ted what were some of your favorite things of the weekend well the um, reactions of the people from uh, you know after finding out what they missed when they failed to attend the home hope lectures right they came back to me it's like you lectured yesterday and because i lectured on on the second day i lectured on uh, the enteric microbiota gut brain um, axis and um uh, and then they found out that I actually lectured the day before and said, oh my God, you know, I really missed it. And people, actually the people who attended the lecture were raving about the first day lecture. So they all came to the booth and asking about, you know, can we still get the slides from you from yesterday and so on. And for me, that's exciting because the feedback that you are getting, you know, they're saying, wow, this is the first time I've really seen a comprehensive framework where we could actually hang what we're doing. Right. So uh, and that for me was uh, uh, the for me, the most exciting part was the interest and the feedback uh, on health optimization, medicine and practice. Scott, highlights for you. Yeah, I have to say I agree with Ted. I and mean, we had so many great conversations afterwards. What was nice about this conference, if anybody's been to like a super large conference like A4M, for example, there's just so many people. It's huge. There's so many booths but it was small. There was maybe about 250 people there, which is a good size, but we had a nice amount of time for people to come out, talk to us for 10, 15, 20 minutes at a time and just talk about their life, talk about their their practice, you know, what's working, what's not working, where they wanna go with their practice. We had young students that were just finishing and getting into their practice. We had people that were much further in their career that were looking for changes or ways to to alt, to, to optimize and to uh, you know make their practice better. So. I had a lot of fun. It was a great time. Uh, if it's okay with you guys, I want to spend a moment on community because one of the reasons why we actually held this symposium was to get everybody together from health optimization, medicine, and practice. And we talked about it a little bit earlier uh, about how people flew in from all over the world. But that element of community was really special to me because you had people that were leaving their clinics. And these are clinics where sometimes they're a one person operator. These are clinics where sometimes they're the owner and business manager. And they came to spend almost an entire week with us in Florida. And we had this interesting, I guess you can call it an amalgamation of people together, whether it was healthcare practitioners, medical doctors, naturopaths, etc. And just watching those interactions to me was was quite special. And you got to see people learning from each other having very late night conversations on <laughs> topics related to health, but also topics not related to health, maybe things, well, I guess social relationships are related to health and watching some of those social relationships start to take off was really, really cool. Yeah. I mean, one thing we didn't mention also is that, so we have our 
essential certification in health optimization medicine and practice. And we had a number of students, many that we were just discussing, that already had taken parts of the course, had taken several modules. And this is the first time everybody was meeting together. We had a cohort of students that finished up this summer, and many of those cohorts, those cohort students were there, and they got to meet each other and see each other. We had been speaking on Zoom weekly for almost 12 weeks, and we all went through it together. They got lectures from Dr. Ted, from Boomer, on the business of Home Hope, myself on several of the lessons within the Metabolomics module. So it was really great just to have everybody in the same location and just be together. Yes, uh, in fact, that's the other highlight that I wanted to tell you guys about is that uh, I had a, a most dear comment that was given to me as the, uh, as a student was leaving, and he said, I thought I was just going to attend a conference, attend the lectures, and then go home. I didn't expect the camaraderie, the, you know, the intimacy of the group and, you know, uh, the way that people share their experiences about health optimization medicine, you know, sharing their lives and how they are planning to, um, uh, to go on with the careers with it. It was, you know, while they said they found my presence inspiring, actually, I found their presence and their stories really most inspiring. And the funniest thing is actually, it, it, the group was so cohesive that when there was a a new format for question and answer where I had to rotate from group to group. I had a posse and the entire, the entire group of them was just Dr. following Ted's me. Groupies. <laughs> no, it was just following me from group to group. And one of them uh, said, and in a very funny way, he said, I will remember two things from this uh, conference. He said, one is that in health optimization, medicine and practice, high is always a four letter word. And second is FOTI. And uh, I was discussing melanotan, you know, in, with some group, and I said, it gives you the photy look. And they looked at me and said, yeah, it's a, called the fresh off the yacht look because it turns you brown, right? But anyway, he said, that's what he remembered from these little things that can only come from practice, right? And that's what he really enjoyed, the details of the practice. Uh, so let's talk about potential symposiums for next year, but also I want to talk a little bit about the cohort format, right? Because this is something that we're running on going, and I think it's special and unique to what we do. And the cohort format is really about building and continuing to build on that element of community. So we've run cohorts before for our metabolomics class. And if you don't mind, Scott, I think you spoke a little bit about it, but just give us sort of that high level view of what the hell a cohort is. Yeah, sure. So we started this this year. This is actually a boomer's initiation, which was a fantastic idea. We wanted to give a more You're intimate... making me blush. Oh, I know. You look like it. Um, you can tell on my hair. Do... <laughs> I, I can't blush. <laughs> <laughs> Dr. T, I can't blush. Okay, so what we wanted to do, as we've been discussing over the last several minutes, is create more of a community and create a sense of togetherness while you're going through the course. Because it can be very lonely sitting on your computer looking at slides and video and trying to learn something when you don't have the clinical context. And what do we have? The three of us is clinical context. And so every week we would have another meeting, usually once a week on a Wednesday evening to talk about the lessons that are in the metabolomics module. So there's about seven or eight weeks of lessons, maybe nine weeks. And we each of that each of those weeks, we had a different lesson led by one of the faculty. Uh, one of us would give a presentation, Dr. Ted would chime in, and we've recorded all those. So for subsequent cohorts going forward, all of those videos are available. We're actually redoing the whole module as well to make it more interactive with more videos and everything else. In addition, we also did a clinical case every month where one of us would present, we would talk about a, a certain case, and we would go through a full health optimization plan for that patient or client and talk about how we would approach it. And the feedback was phenomenal. They just, I think the, the cohort students were just so excited to be able to talk to us and have that interaction. Yeah, so just let me spend a moment on that monthly case because I th it's something that we're going to continue to do and maybe at some point we'll open it up to people who are also on the distribution list and kind of wondering, you know, what is this home hope thing? But the clinical case to me is, uh, and I didn't go to med school, but it's a great way to present your thoughts and also get feedback. So it's that additional layer of learning from your peers. And some of these peers or our people in the cohort have very different backgrounds, very different perspectives. I know, for instance, um, Dr. Ed in 
in the UK has an incredible background in movement and he'll oftentimes bring ideas for movement for things that I didn't even think about. Or you have somebody from you know, Indiana who may have a background in radiation oncology who may look at things in a very different lens. And so having those different perspectives adds new layers and new discoveries in this path to health optimization. Yeah, I would say that it's super interesting the way we do things here at, at, at Home Hope because you know, we're training doctors and healthcare practitioners, so non-licensed healthcare practitioners. And it gives a huge array of experience. And many of these practitioners have done many different things with their life, including the banker over here in the middle that decided it, that they needed to start doing some health stuff instead of being a money guy. Although you're still a money guy, let's let's face it. But um, in, in the end, what's nice about it is that you have this huge breadth of experience, like you said. When we were making the modules for the first time, you know, essentially I stuck to just one question. A client is seated in front of you. What the fuck do you do? So we're very hands on, very clinical. So when you take a look at the module, it's very hands on, very clinical. You can dig on the didactics as much as you can, but your final exams will still be on cases. And again, going back to these case studies, and each week we basically presented instances in clinical, I believe you guys call them clinical pearls, if you will, about how you work with clients and sort of exceptions to the rule, if you will. And then uh, that cohort, you would dive in. So each week you have a certain reading assignment, a certain amount of lectures you want, you need to watch and a certain yeah, lessons that you need to go through as well as the additional resources. But then you join this call where there's an element of community and you get the other persons in your cohort asking questions. And oftentimes that gets you to think about things in a different way. And so we bring that diversity of perspectives to almost everything that we do, again, with that one goal of health optimization. All right, so I want to wrap things up here because this episode is really intended to be just a, a synopsis or summary of a, what was the first health optimization medicine and practice symposium. Before I get into the final question, Home Hope is going to be running cohorts all throughout the year. And so if you're interested in cohorts for metabolomics or any other of the courses, info at homehope.org is the best place to find out the latest and greatest information. If you want to email us, we usually respond very, very quickly. Or, of course, the website, homehope.org. But that leads me to the final question. Uh, and I'm going to put you on the hotspot here. Maybe I'm going to have to answer my own question first, but uh, I'll put you on the hotspot. So uh, predictions for Health Optimization Medicine and Practice Symposium 2024. Maybe a prediction on place. Maybe a prediction on topics you want to cover. Let's go for it. I'll take that because I'm already building what I hinted at will be coming and will it will be the application of artificial intelligence on home hope for first for the practitioners and then for their use of the patients. I'll only say this much because it's going to kill me if I reveal the details of what I'm doing. We need to get everybody listening to this to sign an NDA. <laughs> <laughs> So maybe not Florida, guys. I mean, Florida is great. People who live here, I'm sure you guys love it. But we've been in Florida this year maybe more times than I can count on both of my hands. So, But we're going to look at doing it probably in collaboration with, with other groups. Um, we had a great collaboration with Microbiome Labs. We have several groups that are interested. And we've already gotten a lot of great feedback, as we've been discussing, for this year. So we're really planning on doing something next year. And we'll definitely keep you all posted. Location, time, TBD. So I got to watch very few of the lectures this year. Uh, part of that was because I was emceeing, and one of the benefits of being the MC is that everybody approaches you and asks you questions about the administrative side of the event. But the uh, thing that I would love to do next year is, one, watch the lectures, but two, there are a number of people that pulled me aside to ask questions about the business of Home Hope and really how to start practice, a practice. And so whether it's me or if it's somebody else, uh, we will do some sort of maybe... You know, I actually liked your format of how you were going around for two hours. Maybe that was a little long mm -hmm. and answering people's questions. But having these sort of one hour sessions about the different aspects of the practice of Home Hope, one, of course, is the business, because after all, though we're doing this to help people, it's also nice to be able to support your own self. So uh, that's my my first uh, prediction. And then my second prediction is the location will be awesome. <laughs> 
Perfect. All right. So let's sign off, guys. For everybody out there, please stay equanimous. Dr. Ted, what would you like to say to everybody? Stay equanimous. Dynamic equanimous. Thank you.